Rose-colored hope. Port Earth. Present Earth. Join in Pledge of Allegiance, please. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. At 7.01, I'd like to call the Village of Midlothian Board Meeting for May 10th, 2017 to order. Roll call. Trustee Gillis? Here. Trustee Ivan? Here. Trustee Killily? <coughs> Trustee Christ? Here. Trustee LaRue? Here. Trustee Moskal? Here. Mayor Ivan? Here. Yes. So the last time I'm here. Um, at this time, it's with pleasure, I would like to introduce Cook County, I'm sorry, retired Cook County Circuit Court Judge Noreen M. Daly to do the honors of swearing in Trustee Moskal to be the new village clerk and then the rest of the swearing in of all the elected officials. <laughs> Having been elected, 
having been elected to the position of Midlothian Village Trustee to the position of Midlothian Village Trustee in the Village of Midlothian in the Village of Midlothian in the County of Cook in the County of Cook aforesaid and solemnly swear aforesaid and solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution and that I will support the Constitution of the United States of the United States the Constitution of the State of Illinois the Constitution of the State of Illinois and the ordinances of the Village of Midlothian and the ordinances of the Village of Midlothian and that I will faithfully discharge the duties and that I will faithfully discharge the duties of the office of village trustee of the office of village trustee according to the best of my ability. According to the best of my ability. Alliance for Complete Streets. And I had the pleasure 
of being at a two-day uh, seminar that was required when we received this grant in Orland Park, and Mark was the keynote speaker, and he took us on a walk audit. And it was like, and I walk and run. It was like nothing I had ever done before. So just to give you a little bit of background, I don't want to steal his thunder, but Mark promotes um, building communities that support a healthier, more physically active population, more sustainable, enjoyable lifestyles. He is the former host of America's Walking Series on PBS. I believe he's still an adjunct professor at Tufts University. So um, he knows what he's doing. And I also want to thank Leslie Feinster and Maggie from the Active Transport. Oh, Melody, you're here too. Melody Geraci. Thank you, Melody Geraci from Active Trans. I think I've been working with Leslie for about 10 years. And um, we, we, they, they did our Active Transportation Plan, which we're now using to apply for grant funding. And now we've got a complete streets policy because of them and all this work going on in the background. And I think we are very fortunate that they offered um, to, to have Mark speak to us this evening. So without further ado, uh, Mark Fenton, I'm thrilled that you're here today. Thank you. That's what we know. We know, we know that adults are told to get 30 minutes of physical activity, kids are told to get an hour. 
And we further know that mostly we don't. Uh, maybe 10% of youth, maybe 5% of adults meet those guidelines because our jobs are sedentary, our recreation are sedentary, our transportation is sedentary, we're sitting by the wheel of a car. That young lady walking her bicycle or riding her bicycle to school in the lower right picture is the exception, not the rule. Funny enough, lots of us remember when it was the reverse. Many people in this room, in fact, I'll ask the question, how many people in this room walk or bicycle to school some substantial portion of their youth? Raise your hands high so we get a sense of the room. The national data agrees with what I'm seeing, which is that nearly 50% of us back in the 60s and 70s and 80s walked and biked to school. That number's dropped precipitously, and now we're talking about 10 to 15% of kids at most walking and biking to school. So we know that simply telling people to exercise doesn't solve the problem. Here's an exercise class at a big conference. If somebody's in your face or in a program, you'll do it. But once left to our own devices, we tend to be really busy. Our jobs, our, our households, our children keep us from sort of going and doing formal exercise. What we do know is if we take an approach like this, this is a little bit of public health nerd right here. This is called a socio-ecological approach. And it says, don't just talk to the individual. We talk to families, talk to institutions like schools and workplaces, the community and public policy. Let me put a human face on this. If we wanted to encourage more kids to walk and bike to school, we could tell them to do so. It's good for you. But we could also set up walking groups what they sometimes call walking school buses, a group of kids that walk with one adult every day. And maybe you do Monday and I do Tuesday and somebody else would do Wednesday. My wife actually set one up in our neighborhood very successfully. Maybe we'd have the school institutionalize a curriculum that talks about the benefits of physical activity and we count our steps in math class and calculate distances. Maybe the community would put in more infrastructure like trails and safe street crossing. And maybe we put in place public policies like crossing guards to key intersections. That's called a socio-ecological approach. And it's far more effective than just saying walk to school, it's good for you. Because if it's not safe, frankly, I'm not going to let my kid do it no matter how much you tell me to, right? So we all know that to be true. So here's what the research tells us. We can be successful if we have to operate at all these levels. Here's the good news. When we do that, we get what's called the triple bottom line. Many people refer to this as people, prosperity, and planning. When we build places that are more encouraging and safer for walking, bicycling, and transit use, we tend to see not only the population be healthier, but the local economy is healthier. People tend to shop locally. They don't feel like they have to get in their car to leave town. They can walk to the corner store, down to the main street. And the environment is healthier. Less traffic, less traffic congestion, better air quality, all of those things. So again, the three Ps, people, prosperity, and planet, tend to come from this style of design. Well, Mark, Mark, what is this style of design? The research tells us four things characterize communities that are getting this outcome. And they're the things you're working on, actually. A mix of land uses, so having where we live and work and shop and play closer together rather than spread out. Think neighborhood elementary schools. Think corner stores, not big malls that you have to drive to, right? Neighborhood sort of facility. Then you have to have the network, sidewalks, bike lanes, and so on. You have to have good site design. When you get to a destination, like the picture on the lower right, does it reward you for showing up on foot, or does it punish you? Think about the modern American mall. It says, drive your car here, here's the parking lot. But if you try to walk to the front door, you have to play Frogger to get across that parking lot, right? And last but not least, it has to be safe and accessible for everybody, all ages, all abilities, all disabilities. It's got to work for everybody in the community. Somebody who's visually impaired or blind, somebody pushing a stroller, somebody in a wheelchair, right? If we don't design it with everybody in mind, it won't work. So the research tells us that's what we have to do to get this triple bottom line benefit. A quick side note. As we research bicycling and what it takes to get people bike, we've long suggested there's a curve that looks like this. That there's a group of people at this end that are going to never ride their bikes. There's a group out here already riding their bikes. We call them the strong and the confident. You know that. They've got the $4,000 bike and they wear the cool bike. <laughs> and they're sort of weird. They show up at these meetings and say, why are you building more bike lanes? And we love them. They're great. But they're sort of out of that end. And then in the middle, there are an awful lot of people who say, oops, sorry, that, who say they would, but they're concerned about safety. So they're interested with concerns. And we know that that middle chunk is almost 60% of the population. And what we also know is simply putting down something like this, a share or even painting a bike lane, is not nearly as effective as providing a protected bike facility like this separated lane, like the ones I was showing in Chicago before, or this one from Washington, but I've got pictures all over the country of places building protected bike lanes, or this multi-use trail, separated trail. Think about many of the trails that are along old rail lines like the one here in Skokie. If you really want lots of people biking, you have to actually create more of those facilities on the bottom. Right? If you're happy just with the hardcore serious cyclists, you can do the stuff in those top pictures. But if you really want a larger population, we do have to keep in mind that we've got to build some of this infrastructure. 
So as you think about your complete streets work, I think that's informative. So I'm reminding you that you have to think on three levels. At the macro level, where do we put stuff? Where are we encouraging development to happen? Where is there shopping? Where are there schools and so on? At the network level, the sidewalks, the bike trails, the pathways. And at the micro level, safety and access for all. Make it inviting, make it safe for everybody. Quick side note here. I talked about those two different kinds of development. Think traditional Main Street in the lower left or the big mall on the upper right. We built an awful lot of picture on the right over the last 30 or 40 years. We know the stuff that's more successful, however, is the lower left. Indeed, I can show you that's a Walgreens. I take Walgreens pictures because they're all over, and I'm sorry it's so dark. That's a beautiful Walgreens. It's up in the street. There are street trees. There are benches out in front. There's a bike rack. It's also in Portland, Oregon. And many people would say, well, that's all well and good. Everybody knows Portland, Oregon is a communist enclave. There are nuts out there on the West Coast, and they do that stuff. You're in the United States of America where we have the standard Walgreens. And I could take probably a picture of 10 that looked like that within five miles of here, right? The standard Walgreens is on a corner. It's set back. There's a parking lot out front. Probably no bike rack. The one thing we do know they all have is a drive through in the back because I need to be able to drive through and get my Lipitor prescription with not even standing up, right? I have to drive straight from that to the Dunkin' Donuts so that I can wash down the Lipitor that I'm taking for my high cholesterol. So, and I'm not making any of that up. We know that's all true, right? In all seriousness, however, that doesn't have to be that way. And I, as a guy who serves on a planning commission, have had that conversation with developers. What we really like is that Walgreens up at the street. We want pedestrian access. I'd like the parking out back. I'd like a bike rack. And often they'll say, no, that's not our standard formula. This is our standard formula. And I'm saying this because, you know, it's boards like you that give the final yes or no to this kind of development and has to make that decision. And notably, many communities, so here we are in Nina, Wisconsin. Trust me, not a communist enclave. Middle of Wisconsin, normal people. And people like me serving on the board who said, we don't want to undermine economic development. They told us that's their standard. We're taking it. But in Appleton, Wisconsin, next town over, got that one which is up in the street and has nice trees and pedestrian scale lighting and actually a bike rack and a very small parking area. And it's because they stuck to their guns. A board like you on the night of the hearing when the developer said, you know, if you make us do the picture on the left, we're going to take our application and walk away. They had to have the guts to say, go right ahead. Because this is what our vision for our community is going forward and we expect you to do it. Now I need you to know that I'm considered a pro, not an anti-development guy in my community because I'm the guy who says I'm happy to work with the developer to make that work for them. Maybe reduce the parking requirements so they don't have to create as much paving in the stormwater runoff that, that is very costly to them to handle, right? So I can make it work for you financially. What we also need is residents like you to show up at the public meetings. So on the night of the hearing when these guys say, do it our way or don't do it at all, we need people to line up at the microphone and say, yeah, I want my mom who doesn't drive anymore or my daughter who doesn't have her license yet to be able to safely walk to this Walgreens or whatever the institution is. And it will be much safer for her to do so if it's designed in a way to reward rather than punish the pedestrian. So it matters that we be there to support our elected and appointed board. I'll just tell you the story that in Oak Park they had this historic building on the corner, major corner. Developer wanted to take it. They wanted to raise the building and build a Walgreens there. Three times the village president and the board had to say no to that development application. Three times the developer came back and said, no, 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 just let us tear it down. It's a perfect corner for a Walgreens. Long in the short of it is, eventually, and I don't know if you've ever seen this one, that is in fact a Walgreens. They repurposed the building. And on the back side is the contemporary development where they've got, yes, the bike rack, that seating for a transit stop. Yes, the drive through is over there out of view, but the historic building was maintained on the corner. So the parking is actually behind the building, not on the front. The first thing you see when you pull up to that corner is the historic building. And yes, there's a functional Walgreens there, but they didn't throw it away. They didn't throw away the historic building to get that out. I think that's very informative because it reminds us what we do as a local elected official, what our obligation is to the community. So my four bits of recommendation based on the lessons I've learned from successful communities around the country, I'll just summarize pretty quickly here. One is that you need to lead by setting a vision, which you're doing, I believe, already, doing things like adopting a complete streets policy, working on an implementation plan. Um, I think you're working on um, sort of creating that framework, going after the grants that Karen mentioned a moment ago to actually do implementation. Those are very important. But also, let's start selling the economic benefits. If people say, well, I'm not a bicyclist, you don't have to be to benefit from this. We know that the marketplace is demanding to live. Housing in these kinds of communities is much more desirable, more walk and bike friendly communities. We know that developers on the bottom picture there are really looking at strip malls and boxes like that and saying, how can we redevelop this into much more walkable, much more mixed use? Retail on the first floor, maybe apartments above. 
Um, we know that those places, once built, perform better. Indeed, um, I will tell you two specific bodies of research that I find most compelling. The National Association of Realtors, their publication on the left, and the National Association of Builders, their publication on the right, both are recognizing walkable communities as in high demand, and indeed, the cover story of that special issue of Belt Builder Magazine was Walkability, Why We Care and You Should Too. And the reason home builders care about walkability is because it sells. And the reason that realtors care about walkable neighborhoods, the special focus of that issue, is because it sells. Indeed, it is being driven by both a demand among the millennials, you know, that population group, and also empty nest baby boomers who are saying, I'm ready to not live in a suburb where I have to get in my car to do absolutely everything, go to shop, go to church, go to take my kids to school. I'd like to actually be in a more walkable space, a bikeable space. So we know the market is moving here, and we know these places perform better. These are two studies that show that the actual retail, do retail dollars per square foot, basically, are higher on more walk and bike friendly streets. Now here's the interesting thing. People will say, somebody rides their bike to the store, they can't possibly buy as much as somebody who drove up in the car. And indeed they don't. They don't buy as much per visit. But what do they do? They visit much more often. Because that's a street you like to be on. We've slowed the traffic. We've made it safe to cross. And by the way, when you come to that street, you're much more likely to go to multiple stores. I'll stop here where I was going to shop, but I'll also look in the window of that one, and then I'm going to stop to the coffee shop over there, and because it's not taking my life in my hands to get across anymore. Right? This is a very different approach to roadway design, but it's what a complete streets approach says, isn't it? It's just what we want to say. So that's number one. Let's sell the economics and then benefit from those economic benefits when number two, you actually implement the complete streets policy you've embraced. So that means the most important lesson here is what I call routine accommodation. Every time you touch the road, even your routine paving program, your painting program, digging it up to do sewer work, ask the question when we put it back, can we make it a more complete street? Can we simply narrow the lanes a little bit and thereby have a couple of feet left over to make a bicycle lane? Should we be repainting the sidewalks while we're doing the road work? Should we improve the crosswalks at the key intersections, or should there be a mid-block crossing? So that the, complete, the street really is complete, that is to say it works for pedestrians, bicyclists, transit, and motor vehicles, not just for cars. Because that's basically what a complete street policy says. It doesn't say don't build for cars, it says build for all four. Always think about how all four groups, the pedestrian, the bicyclist, the transit, and motor vehicle, will navigate. So an example, oh, one of the ways communities are doing that, by the way, if you say, well, are there examples out there? There are. The National Association of City Transportation Officials have published beautiful guidelines on how to do this, on best practices that are on the ground already. So we don't have to put down untried approaches. There are examples that are out there that have been tested and that we know how to do. And by the way, CMAP, which is working on your plan for you, has, is, is an example of a metropolitan planning organization which we see them leading the charge around the country. In fact, a, a group came, uh, Active Trans helped facilitate a group of them coming to a workshop we did in Atlanta with the Centers for Disease Control. But I'm showing you that MPOs, planning organizations like CMAP from Los Angeles to Nashville to New York and Boston on the East Coast, are all reallocating how they're spending their dollars. And they're rethinking whether it's just about adding more lanes to highways. Or if maybe the better choice is making local streets more livable and getting us off of those highways by giving us other choices. So you know these kinds of these kinds of investments you see pictured here. It's not just that freeway in the upper left anymore. In fact, less and less do we even see those projects getting funded. We see the money going in another direction now. A great example from just downstate Urbana, Illinois, Champaign-Urbana, where University of Illinois is. That was a four-lane road that was about to be repaved. They explored it and they realized they were having lots of collisions as cars tried to turn left across two oncoming lanes of traffic. And meanwhile, when you stopped to make that left turn, you were getting rear-ended or caught, cars would go around you and cause delays in the right lane. Now, I know you don't have any roads that look like this in Midlothian, but if you did have big four-lane roads like this, you might consider what they considered, which was to evaluate whether it really needed four lanes or whether a lane reduction, in this case a three-lane alignment, actually worked better. And that's precisely what they came up with. There were people who said there's no possible way three lanes would carry as much as four. In fact, a couple of the businesses along that corridor blew a gas. They said, you're going to kill my business. What, in fact, they now admit is they have far fewer collisions trying to get in and out of their businesses because people aren't trying to turn left across two lanes to get in. Because now what they have is the center turn lane, so the turning vehicle moves out of the travel lane. That for, therefore, that lane is not unimpeded. And when I make the left turn, I'm also only crossing one lane of oncoming traffic. The other advantage, by the way, in doing that was I got room for a bike lane on each side and holy mackerel, an island in the middle for pedestrians to cross, 
So if I'm here and I want to get on the northbound bus, I cross at that island, and there's the bus pull up. We've improved it for cars, first and foremost, safer, fewer collisions, moving just as much traffic, and also made it safer for pedestrians, bikes, and transit users as well. That's a great complete streets project, and let me say it again, it was being done when they were repaving the road anyway. So the marginal cost, the additional cost, very modest, because they were in the middle of a repaving program anyway. These are the things we want to think about and you want to have on your radar as you're chipping away. And I know you say, well, some of these roads are county roads, some of them are state roads, of course. But we should be part of that conversation every single time. Um, and there are lots of proven tools out there, fancy tools like median islands and roundabouts. We've seen roundabouts installed instead of signalized intersections. There's lots of good data on when they can work well, reduce collisions, and reduce delay. And maybe about roundabouts, less long-term maintenance costs. You don't have lights, you don't have electricity, right? Once you've taken all the signal lights out. I know some people are terrified around the lights. I'm going to get in and go around and never get out. I know that that sounds like that. <laughs> but the reality is the good ones, the properly designed ones, work very well. They actually reduce collisions and they're quite easy to navigate. For simple things like curb extension. Here's the problem. When you look at these pictures, you say, a lot of cement there, Mark. I think those are pretty costly interventions. We're seeing communities do stuff with paint and vertical delineators and sort of flexible bollards. Sign here and paint here, just paint on the on the on the pavement to create that bike lane in Skokie. The point being, there are inexpensive approaches to these sorts of things, and they are being very successful. We're seeing communities have good success. In Billings, Montana, we were working there on their walk to school program. Remember the pyramid I showed before? This was identified as a key in, uh, intersection, a crossing. It's actually a mid-block crossing. School, a neighborhood on the right, middle school on the left. Here's the problem: Public Works says we don't have any money to make a fancy crosswalk here. We said, could you do simply some rubberized curbing to narrow curbing to extend the, uh, the curb and narrow the lane a little, paint the crosswalk, put the signs in. They said, we'll try it. We don't expect anybody to cross it. It was so successful, so many kids eventually started using it, that when they repaved that road, six years later, they repaved it with a permanent high visibility crosswalk there. Because they were willing to make the low cost trial investment, right, that led them to when they were repaving anyway, and it wouldn't be more expensive to do the high quality crossing because parents have established the demand. Yes, our kids are going to cross here. Right? This is why we make those low cost investments. Last but not least, we've got to engage the community and actually go out and try stuff. And I know you have. I know you've worked with Active Trans on some of their what we call pop up installations. One of the best things we can do is the walk audits, like the one we did. Going out and walking and experiencing the environment. In the upper left, we're walking with the school for the blind and local. In the lower left, we were working with the local senior center. A lot of people in wheelchairs and motorized chairs. And in the right, we were working in Kingsport, Tennessee, on their beautiful trail system. And we found the local kids gave us the best intelligence. Because they knew where all the shortcuts. See that little dirt path right there? They knew, I call those goat trails. Those are the little trails that kids wear, the shortcuts right into the back of the school or across the street or behind them. Well, that might be an appropriate place for an actual pedestrian or a bicycle facility. There may be enough demand. So we reach out to all of the members of our community of all abilities and disabilities to help, and ages to help us determine where these treatments are needed. So that when we were working in Whitefish, Montana, and parents said, we're really hesitant to ride, let our kids ride on this really wide road, we said, what if we created a protected bike lane? So there's a temporary protected bike lane, which proceeded to fill the schoolyard with bikes during Bike to School Week. As a result, Public Works is now exploring which street they're going to put, that street or the parallel street, are they going to put a nice protected bicycle lane on. But they tried it during one bike to school week last spring, just to test the idea. And in Livingston, Montana, this is how wacky they are, they talked about a possible roundabout at that intersection, so they made one out of hay bales. And they said, let's bring the biggest fire truck in the fleet and make sure that it can get around. Let's bring in the school buses and make sure the bus drivers are comfortable so that they could actually size the thing. It's right near a school and where their farmer's market is. The point is we can try stuff, and we can see what works, and we can adjust. We can adjust. We don't have to sort of lock it, lock it in stone initially. I want to mention the three most common rebuffs I get to this work to conclude. One thing people say is we don't know how. This is, it sounds like great, great stuff, but we don't know how to design roundabouts or these special bike lanes and so on. And the answer is yes, we do. We've got lots of guides like those NACTO guides. We've got examples from all over the country. We've got examples from parts of the country that have snow and have to do snow plowing because that's often a concern. Wait a minute, we're a cold weather environment. We get the snow in the winter. Right, we've got examples from the Minneapolis and St. Paul's and the Duluths and the Burlington, Vermont. We can look at other communities that are trying these things and see what works and what doesn't. The second thing is, how are we going to pay for it, right? The financial pressure. 
And my answer is I hope I've given you examples of how we can do low cost initial installations, trial installations, or do it when other stuff is happening anyway, the routine accommodation. That is, in fact, the most successful way cities and towns across the country are doing it, when they're doing other work anyway. Don't think of this as special. Think of this as the new norm. The last one, this is the top. I've, and I've had this happen in my time. Indeed, that picture on the right is a trail that we eventually built in my community. We call it the Driftway Trail. It's uh, along a road there. Beautiful multi use path. But this is one called the American River Trail in Sacramento, California. Tough right of way. It, it's almost underneath an elevated expressway here at one point. It's one of the hardest portions. It's a gorgeous trail, by the way, along the American River in Sacramento. If you're out there, go on it. And we've had people say in these kinds of circumstances, after we've dealt with the finance question, after the technical question, how do we do it, they'll say, well, nobody's going to walk there. Nobody's going to ride there by far. I literally had one of the selectmen in my town say, I don't know why we're going to try to build this trail. I never walked there. I'm, nobody's going to walk there. I never will. So they do the I never, right? And I have a special answer to that. And I developed this over years, and I'm getting old enough now that I don't have the patience to deal with people who think they're the most important person in the world. And whether they walk there or not really matters. But they insist. So I say, I don't really care whether you will or not. Because we know all those people. We know that kid's going to ride a skateboard, and that kid's going to ride a bike, and those people are going to walk in. This dad and, and, and his son are going to ride their bike down to the green to come to see the new gazebo. That's a shop from right here. And these people are going to ride their bike down to one of the train stations, the metro station. So you don't have to, because every one of those people is one less car on the road that you have to compete with. By the way, it's one less car you have to compete for a parking space with. They're not dumping their greenhouse gases into the air, their emissions in the air for you to breathe. Their tires aren't generating dust that go into the stormwater runoff. So you don't have to suffer any of those costs and ills associated with it. Furthermore, those people, because they're being more physically active, are less likely to have a heart attack. And because we're all in the big insurance pile together now, when they don't have a heart attack, your premiums won't go up. So you don't ever have to use the trail. You benefit if they do. And I know I sound like a total fanatic nut. I know I do. Except that all the data is on my side. We have the evidence now that what I just said is true. That those benefits do accrue to the communities that invest in this infrastructure. And yes, there is a cost up front to some degree. But in the end, the benefits far outweigh that. And the real reason I'm a raving prophet of the mouth lunatic, and you know this because we've talked about it before, it's quite frankly not for you or me, or for most of us in the room, but for a handful of those younger people, including my kids, who are now 19 and 21, but I've frozen them in time for you at 3 and 5, because they were much cuter and asked for a lot less money back then. But most importantly, because they're part of the first generation in the United States, and in fact in modern society, that's going to end up with shorter life expectancies than their parents. We expect with their generation, their generation, life expectancy may tick down by as much as two years. And the problem with that is, that never happened when we were dealing with infectious diseases. But now that we're dealing with diseases based on unhealthy lifestyles, cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, essentially based on sedentary lifestyles, now we're seeing life expectancy, expectancy may actually backslide. And it's our obligation, I believe, to build communities where those kids could walk to school like at least half of the room raised our hands and said we did. And live like free range kids, because that's what I was. I was a free range kid. Disappear on a Saturday morning. I'm like, let's build that wolf for that. I know that's your goal because I know you guys as a community have made policy statements in that direction. You're trying to build plans in that direction. And I, I encourage this board to make even the routine day-to-day -day decisions, because they're the ones that matter most, those day-to-day -day decisions that you make in that direction as well. And I thank you for the opportunity to visit with you guys about it, and I'm happy to take questions if you like. But thank you.
So since those bike lanes have gone in, they are being used, not just for um, right. uh, exercise. Uh, exercise, right. Yeah. People are actually using those bike lanes to get themselves to and from work. So they, they are being used. Great. And that's not a car. You know, if that person's there, then they're not driving a car into work that day. Right. So, thank you. Great. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
if we get a bad enough flood, if I will go downstairs and find a chunk of the basement wall on the floor and a big hole in the foundation walls. Could several small floods cause that? The person next door knows there is flooding in our yard. I have tried to talk to her about it. I have asked her where her water drains on her property. She has been snotty to me, telling me, so what? As long as no one's getting hurt, it doesn't matter. She has hung up the telephone on me when I tried to talk to her about it. Do you think she is going to do the right thing and fix this on her own? Would you please help me with this flooding? Is it right for a driveway next door to do this to someone's home? <coughs> Superintendent DeSimone, you, you know about this, right? Can we have a conversation after me or tomorrow about this situation? Yes, sir, Mayor. We've been out to the house on several, several occasions. Okay. Um, there'd be nothing short than having the driveway next door done to rectify any of the water that's coming from our property. We have taken precautionary measures by having to relocate any discharge that's going off of the neighbor's property, which is relocation of some pump and the downspout for the causing excess water from the doctor's driveway. I feel we can only really consider it. Uh, the homeowner has said that within the next year or so she is going to replace the driveway. And at that time, it's going to be pulled down with a permit so it will be prepared properly so we can eliminate that problem. I'd like to personally look. Yes, sir. Sure. Love, like love it. Love it. Yeah. We'll, uh, we'll do what we can. Any other comment? Coming? Good evening, Valerie Weiskirk. Um, tonight, I am actually a very inspired and hope-filled resident of Midlothian. Um, whether the rest of the seven billion people on this planet realize it or not, our world changed enormously tonight with the swearing in of the new people. However, the interesting thing is, you guys are not so new, are you? Uh, Mayor LaRue, you had to bear the burden of my putting on your shoulders numerous issues as a trustee. You are now mayor. As part of that, I do want to put on your plate, just for consideration, right now, according to my count, there were a total of seven investigations that were filed with the Sheriff's Office. Only three so far, there's been reports back, and the public in the entirety to have a right to know not only what all those investigations were, but what was the outcome. So I hope you certainly will see that through in your new position as mayor. Um, as for you, Clerk Moskal, <laughs> that'll take a moment to adjust too. Um, you as trustee also had to shoulder the burden of a great deal of my complaints, especially when it comes to the municipal code book and things like that. And I just wanted to refresh really quick and remind, we're still lacking, for example, that certified copy from Sterling Codifiers. And I do find it important to put on the document or the record tonight that unfortunately the former clerk couldn't even do his job on his going out because there are no minutes on the agenda for you guys to perform. Uh, Clerk Mostel, I will give you no quarter either if you slip up. I'm going to make comment to you also. Um, Trustee Cavaney, you, you, you were our watchdog on the list of bills. And as a resident, I know I was always most appreciative. Now I get to burden you just a hair more because now that you're a trustee, you get more than five minutes to look at it. And I hope you will take that to heart and you will still be the watchdog for all of us when it comes to those lists of bills and that you do get to spend more time than just the five minutes you would kindly share with us doing what you could. And of course, Trustee Christ, Trustee Gillis and the rest, it's easy to say you guys have already been here and it's no big deal, but actually it is because the dynamics so significantly changed tonight that even you two, let alone the trustees that were not up for election, I meant it. I am so inspired. I am so hope filled. I just, I can't wait, you know, whether I live here in Midlothian or not, as I am in the process of moving, not only will I still consider this my home where I have friends and family, I will still do whatever I can to help this community, no matter where I'm living on this planet, because my friends and my family and my home has been here in Midlothian. So thank you very much, and I wish you guys luck, because it's not going to necessarily get easier. We're still going to come at you, but I think we have a full board now that actually can accommodate all of the unique situations and common ones that we're going to come up with. So thank you for your time. Anyone else? Seeing as no, no further public comment, I will close the public comment.
move on to the consent agenda. The only thing on tonight's consent agenda is the list of bills. Are we looking for a motion to approve the consent agenda? I'll make a motion. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, roll call for Council. Trustee Hyman? Aye. Trustee Price? Aye. Trustee Gillis? Aye. Trustee Killen? Aye. Trustee King? Present. <clears throat> and we will move on to trustee of business, trustee Karen Price. <laughs> Under the fire department this evening, um, the first item that I have um, is the approval of the firework permit for the Local Country Club on July 3rd prior to last week's committee meeting. I forwarded, I forwarded to you all the information that was provided <coughs> uh, by Chief Hot Wagner. So with that being said, I would like to make a motion to approve uh, this firework permit. We have a motion. Is there a second? A second. We have a motion and a second. No call. Trustee Christ? Aye. Trustee Kelly? Aye. Trustee Gillis? Aye. Trustee Ivan? Aye. Trustee Kavey? Aye. The motion carried. The next item under the fire department is the approval of reimbursement to firefighter paramedic Kevin Kelly for officer training for $312. I provided everyone with documentation. He attended this training on his own time, and this is required uh, training for him in his new position as engineer. So I'd like to make a motion to approve that expenditure. A second. Trustee Christ. Aye. Trustee Gillis. Aye. Trustee Caden. Aye. Trustee Ivan. Aye. Trustee Kelly. Aye. The motion carries. Under community development, I have a number of updates. We'll try to be quick. The first item is the approval of the consultant engineer <coughs> and tariff for the Illinois Green Infrastructure uh, Grant. And as everyone knows, this we had to uh, go through the, the process again after the original grant that we had was put on hold from the state because there was no capital budget. Well, we have the grant agreement finally from the state. We can be, begin work on this. This is for the permeable parking lot south of the VFW that is owned by the village. I provided everyone with a copy of the uh, agreement from Antero. Attorney Freeman revised the terms and conditions as he felt they were not favorable to the village. I submitted the term, the revised terms and conditions to Antero. They have no problem with any of the uh, terms and conditions. So uh, I do have one question that came up from Trustee Caveney, who um, very diligently uh, reviewed the document. And I believe we can discuss that after I make the, <coughs> and we might amend on the face. So, so I'm going to make a motion that we approve the consultant engineering with Antero for the IDIC site. We have a motion. A second. Uh, Mike, I've, I've got to ask about this guy. No, it's not. Any discussion? There is discussion. And this was one of the questions the attorney brought up as well as he reviewed it. Um, under project assumptions, they listed that the village will reimburse um, at four expenses at cost plus 15%. The attorney recommended that Intero establish a not to exceed reimbursable expense without um, prior village approval. Uh, Trustee Caveney thought we could put a cap on it around 10%. So I think we need to amend the proposal on its face and hopefully they will accept it, but I'm asking for input. I think Kathy made, Trustee Kennedy made a very good point too that uh, Ontario's only uh, by the contract obligated to one visit. Well, they, they, we, have, we actually have a meet one site visit when construction begins. Um, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, excuse me for interrupting, I believe the way it was written, it was during preparation. It was during preparation and construction, they were only going to make one site visit. <coughs> so I'm thinking that we probably need more than one site visit. Only because this area is going to be between 
private club property, which is the BMW, and then the village's property, which is the main garden. So we need to make sure that when the area is being prepped, that it's graded properly. So it's not going toward the BMW, so it's not going to interfere or damage the rain garden. And <coughs> of course, we do want the runoff to go to the rain garden. We have some instance there, but we still need to make sure that the, that the area is prepped properly. Could I just tell you the, the whole the whole sequence with with these grants? So we've got we've got this grant is about fifty one thousand dollars, and the village also was awarded another hundred and fifty thousand dollar grant from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, mm -hmm. which as soon as we submit our twenty fifteen audit, they will release that funding in Washington D.C. So what? So the conventional wisdom is that once that grant funding is released, and Superintendent Sperry knows about this because we've talked about this in public steering committee meetings, is that funding will enable us to put in a more robust uh, parking area. And what I mean by that is um, Klaus Dunkelberg, who's one of the consultant engineers for the MWRD project, it indicated that if we had the funding, we should look at a more sustainable parking lot. And this is all green infrastructure. This is all green infrastructure to reduce runoff into the Volcan Creek. And there is a product out there that the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District uses that they are going to use in our flood mitigation project. And it will reduce the life cycle costs of maintaining the parking lot. Um, and Superintendent Sperry thought that was a great idea because if we were to put in this permeable asphalt with the money we have, it requires a lot of maintenance. So, so we are hoping. Do we want to table this? No, we don't. But we, want, we have to keep moving, and I'll tell you why. We have, with the, um, we have the agreement, and we have to start meeting some timelines with the IEPA in Springfield. So I think I, we could amend the proposal on the base, <coughs> plus, plus 10 percent, does that sound reasonable, and one additional site visit. At some point when that additional funding is released from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, we're probably going to have to amend this proposal because more work will be required. Okay, if we can amend it to add for an additional site visit during the prep prior to the actual pouring of the <coughs> materials, that would be fine. I just have one comment, Trustee. Okay. Um, I think, I have no idea because I haven't spoken to Intero, but if you add another site visit, that's going to affect their bottom line as far as the cost is concerned. I understand why they agreed to our other changes and even the 10%, um, the not to exceed 10% amount probably won't affect their price. Right. But adding additional site visit, you know, for someone from their staff to come down and spend some time here, I, I just want to mention to you, it wouldn't surprise me if you go back to them with that change if they say that we can't hold the price that we gave you. So, Approximately, what do we think the site visit I, I, I have no idea, but I, I'm just throwing it out because it wouldn't surprise me if they say, well, you know, we're going to have to add something. Okay, this is what I'm going to do. Can I ask a question? Superintendent, I really can't because I don't know what that engineering room costs to the engineer or whatever the situation would be. I think it was under $200 an hour. $180 an hour. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. You know what? I think I have a solution. Let's, let's, let's approve it this evening. I will ask them if they will add an additional site visit. If they, if they will not, as part of the scope, I will find out what it is and I will bring that back to the board for approval. Does that make sense? So you made a few motions, but... We're going to add... We're going to... I will ask them to add a site visit, okay? I think... Okay? So we'll just approve this with changing it to cost plus 10%.
Trustee Gillis? Aye. Trustee Kilburn? Aye. Motion carries. Next item, and I find it on here, um, Mark Fenton talked about the CMAP, which is actually the acronym for Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning. Um, we have another grant with them for the work that they're doing uh, for the study uh, on 147th Street from Cicero to Kevin. They actually uh, emailed me today about setting up an additional meeting to talk about um, the Great Guard designs that they have completed <coughs> and in April 30th, and this is for the extension. Um, they asked if I could sign it, and I said I could not sign it without more approval. So I would like to make a motion to extend the agreement if I could sign it. I believe somebody have a copy of the card that I sent it to everybody. I, I can get, I always have a lot of paper because I have a lot of projects. I believe it's to June 30th, so I would like to make a motion to extend their work. We are setting up another meeting. There's no cost to the village. We have a motion? I'll motion. We have a second. Second, second. Huh? Second. <laughs> Any further discussion? Any discussion? Roll call. Trustee Christ. Aye. Trustee KB. Aye. Trustee Gillis. Aye. Trustee Iden? Aye. Trustee Kilby? Aye. Motion carries. The next item on the agenda is two weeks ago, the board approved the um, resolution in the First Amendment to the Economic uh, Incentive Agreement with Grills. However, when I was given the copy back from the clerk's office, there was no date um, in here. And under uh, Section 2, parentheses 1, Section 3, it states, in addition, true value shall cause a sprinkler system to be installed on the property, substantially described in Exhibit A1, attached hereto, and made a part hereof. Installation of the sprinkler system shall include extension of a water line and be completed on or before, and there's no date, 2017, in compliance with the federal <coughs> state and village laws and ordinances. So, we need to fill in a date. And I'll show this to you. This would be for the installation of the sprinkler system itself, the complete system, correct? That, that's correct, Trustee. Okay. And I don't recall if it was a specific date that was discussed by the board uh, at the meeting or that was uh, discussed by the trustees terms of what they thought an appropriate date might be, and I don't know if the fire chief had a specific date in mind when this was discussed with him. So whatever date works for the board for the fire chief works for me, uh, there's, no, there's no legal question that what okay. the date is inserted. I had a discussion with Chief Hot Wagner, and he thought 120 days would be appropriate. Does the board have a problem if we put it out, say, 120 days from today? That would take us June, October. It would take us to what, approximately October 10th? How long did we give uh, order?
I'll second it. Yeah, a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Four copies. Trustee Christ. Aye. Trustee Ivan. Aye. Trustee Kaveny. Aye. Trustee Gillis. Aye. Trustee Kibble. Aye. Motion carries. Uh, tomorrow morning, uh, the Village of Midlothian will be hosting the Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning um, Forum for input for their on to 2050 plan. It will be at Village Hall at 9.30 in the morning. Uh, we've invited our planning commission, board members, I hope you all can attend and your, import, your input is important. Uh, department heads, if you're available, you are certainly welcome to attend as well. So that's tomorrow morning, 9.30. Um, you're hearing a lot of Chicago Metropolitan Agency for planning the CMAP, and I just wanted to point out we spent this this afternoon. Uh, they are having a local technical assistance symposium uh, at Roosevelt University on Tuesday, May 16th, <coughs> and this is kind of funny because they asked me to sit on one of their panels. Aww. So I, um, I'm i going to, well actually, um, at the trans asked me to sit on their panel, but CMAP beat them to it. So I'm sitting on a panel about implementing plans, and we got a lot of them, and we're working on them. And I'm in the esteemed company of the village manager from Riverside and the uh, village manager from Park Forest. And I think, Mary, you're going to be there, right? Yes. So it's all day. It's all day. You have to register in advance. Um, there's 10 separate panels, so uh, I'm really honored. And I'm I wasn't asked to sit on one of them. You are? I was not. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to have to present, and uh, they just sent this this afternoon. So I, I think that's an honor. I, I get to showcase some of the work that we've done, a lot of the work that we've done in the Lothian. And now that we have a captive audience here tonight, just a, a couple of plugs on uh, our fifth Wednesday where we don't typically have a meeting, May 31st at 6.30. Um, Metropolitan Water Reclamation District and their design engineers, Burns McDonald, are hosting a public hearing on the final design and construction of a flood control project on Natalie Creek in Midlothian and Oak Forest. This is the $8.3 million flood mitigation project. I believe they're going to be announcing dates. So it's, it's for real residents. A lot of work is going into this. And thank you, Helen and Flynn Lopin, for getting us to this point.
three cameras for the jail cells to include audio and rolling lights that to exceed the cost of $1,382. And the reason being is in the past what we have done is we've um, used part-time uh, jail watchers, part-time police officers, uh, clerks who have uh, worked overtime. And what we are asking for, what the um, police chief is asking for, is to um, use these cameras to alleviate the cost of using the <coughs> part-time individuals or overtime individuals um, to use these cameras with the audio to replace the service of using um, part-time individuals or um, uh, employees instead of um, uh, not having a specific cost. Now we know what it's going to cost us to monitor our, our free scale cell. So I know that we haven't talked about this at the committee, but uh, by utilizing this as soon as possible with the CalCon uh, 911 service in place, the sooner we do this, the more money we are going to save. That's why I'm asking uh, to do, do this tonight. Cost that the state exceed thirteen hundred eighty two dollars. So I'd like to make a motion to um, purchase these three cameras for one thousand three hundred eighty two dollars. A motion is a second. I'll second. Any discussion? I have a question. Uh, if the cam purpose of the cameras is to eliminate having uh, human being there in the jail to monitor the cells. Who's going to monitor the cameras? And if there is an issue, how quickly is, you know, how quickly can um, someone from the police department get there? It's an overnight situation. They're monitored by radio operators to Calcutta. So as soon as something was to happen, they would basically radio call one of our uh, police officers on the street or someone in the station if someone happens to be in the station. Okay. So it's immediate response. Okay. Is that correct, Chief? Yes. Does that include insulation? For the H2? Yes. And I have basically given everybody a um, uh, copy of the receipt, so we just have the label, which is included. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Trustee Gillis? Aye. Trustee Ivan? Aye. Trustee Kaylee? Aye. Trustee Kimberly? Aye. Trustee Price. Aye. Motion carries. <laughs> um, as far as the historical society update, as everybody knows, um, we did um, celebrate our 90th birthday for the village on March 17th. Obviously, St. Patrick's Day for a Scottish town, which is pretty cool. Um, we are working on a um, 90th birthday committee. Um, and we have a uh, group of individuals that are meeting, and we actually have a meeting tomorrow night. And what we are doing is we are um, making a schedule for the month of June and July, and we are combining different activities with um, different entities in town, meaning the park district, the school district, the village, the uh, chamber, and uh, <coughs> What I've given the board is basically a tentative schedule um, showing the different activities um, that will be going on during these months. And tomorrow night we have a meeting scheduled at 6.30 at the Historical Society. It is open to the public. What we are trying to do is come up with additional events that we will add to the schedule. And what we are trying to do is include um, activities throughout every weekend during the month of June and July um, that will basically cover um, activities that will um, celebrate all fashions of um, the era of our village um, going back to 1927. And as much as we can cover during those months, um, bringing as much light as we can and, and different things that will educate not only our, our youth, but people who have um, recently moved into town, people who have 
um, lived in town who may not know a lot about our, our uh, history of Middle Ethiopia, but also people who have lived in town that would like to share some of the history that they know. Uh, um, we will be reaching out to people who have uh, lived in town for a long time, a short time, who have gathered information and would like to share it. Um, we will be celebrating some of the historical homes that we have in town. Uh, people are aware of uh, the historical society and what it has to offer. Um, there, there's quite a bit of history in town that a lot of people that are um, new to the um, they, they're not even aware of what we have to offer as far as the historical <coughs> society um, has in, in place there. There is uh, uh, audio interviews, um, uh, video interviews of people that have grown up in this town for um, many years ago um, that we're going to put on display. Um, it, it's going to be a very cool June and July. Um, I'm not going to give all our secrets away. If you'd like to know more, attend the meeting tomorrow. Um, there's going to be activities. Um, they're going to include things like a tree walk, um, a, uh, a walk through the country club of some of the old set, uh, homes. Um, we're going to include um, some of the activities that will uh, branch out with the uh, education committee. Um, a whole lot of things. Um, we're working with the library, so there's, there's a whole lot to offer. We'll have Scheduled at the, the village hall, scheduled at the park district, um, scheduled also at the library. Um, so stay tuned. But um, again, we have a meeting tomorrow night at 6:30. It will last an hour. We'll be covering some of the things that we'll be adding, and uh, it's going to be a very interesting June and July. Uh, I believe that is all I have. And now one other thing, I'm sorry. I'd like to thank the volunteers who are helping out in the historical society. We have um, started some additional work there, um, some painting and uh, additional interior work, exterior work. Um, so it's going to be going on, and some of the groups there that are volunteering their time will be working there, and uh, it's going to be. Really changing and looking good for the ones of June and July. And that's all I have. Thank you, Trustee Kelly. Trustee Kelly. You pull it straight forward. Pardon me? Pull it forward and the cord comes bigger. Um, oh. So, um, I do have a big mouth, but my voice is not too good tonight. Um, I'd like to uh, start out by asking for the approval of uh, for hiring uh, Nicholas Wicke for public maintenance utility worker one and a starting salary of twenty one ninety five. I'd like to make that motion. We have a motion. Second. I'll second. Any discussion? Any discussion? <coughs> Trustee Kelly. Aye. Trustee Christ? Aye. Trustee Kaley? Aye. Trustee Gillis? Aye. Trustee Ivan? Aye. Motion carries. Okay, I'd like to make a couple of pitches tonight. And one is, uh, I think tonight, you, you know, you can hear from what uh, Trustee Gillis is talking about with the anniversary, 90th anniversary of the uh, village celebration. But uh, we have a great crowd tonight. I think tonight you are witnessing the start of a rebirth of uh, the Volkian. I think you're here because you're all very proud uh, to be Midlothian residents. I see a lot of people who have done a lot of great things in Midlothian. And uh, so we're going to ask your help uh, during, at May 20th, uh, we have our uh, cleanup day. And so it starts at 9 o'clock uh, at uh, Village Hall. It's going to go on until about 1 or 1 30. Uh, there's going to be an Arbor Day celebration, I believe, at 12.30 or 1, I don't know what time. Uh, after that, there's going to be some uh, good uh, food for the volunteers. We're going to go around and we're going to clean up some of the problem areas of Midlothian, the places you see 
uh, a lot of refuse around, a lot of uh, branches and uh, leaves and everything like that that we don't normally get to clean up. The more people we have come, the uh, more things we can do. Um, so we'd ask you to uh, please consider to come out on that Saturday. Also, we're going to have uh, electronics recycling. So it's going to cover all forms of, of recycling, including uh, TVs. Now, if you do recycle a TV, it's going to cost, or a, or a computer monitor, it's going to cost $25. But what's in the works is, that we're going to give you, uh, if you do recycle your TV or monitor, we're going to give you $25 worth of coupons that you can use for middle businesses. So in, 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 if you use all those coupons, it's not going to cost you a thing to uh, recycle. And I don't know where the location is. It might be a village hall. It might, might also be a grills that has to be. It's going to be a grills. It's going to be a grills. Thank you. So uh, when you go to grills, they have a new uh, greenhouse, by the way. And you can see their nice rain garden, and also you can recycle your electronics. So we'd like to ask you, if you got time on Saturday on the 20th, come out and help us clean up uh, Midlothian. Also, um, in line with uh, uh, Trustee Gills' pitch for the 90th anniversary, we talked about the beautification committee. The beautification committee is going to have their annual garden walk uh, July 9th. So as part of the celebration also for the 90th uh, anniversary, you can uh, buy tickets at the Village Green. Uh, in the past, last year they had 10 houses, I believe it was, Carol? 10 to 12 houses, which is probably the biggest garden walk on the south side. So uh, you can see some of the beautiful gardens and uh, vegetation for your neighbors and maybe get some ideas for your own house. So. Uh, Thank you, and uh, that's all my board for tonight. Thank you, sir. Trustee Kathleen Kev, do you have anything tonight? <laughs> no. Oh, oh, well, I was not, since I was not on the agenda, I have not very much, but I do want to say that I am very pleased to be sitting up here. A little nervous. I'm used to sitting in the audience and yelling at you for the last four years. So, if anybody wants to come in and yell at me, I'm ready to take it. <laughs> thank you very much for your support. And thank you very much for your
<laughs> There's going to be a meeting on Friday on the reservoir to review the structural integrity of the beams above it. Uh, the project's not gone out to bid, and we're going to fine tune the cost estimate. Uh, right now, we're, we're in, the, in the investigation process of it. This, this is the, the three million. Three million. Yes. Three million yeah. Yeah. Mr. Brady? Nothing, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Very good. Other than congratulating the new members of the board and the new mayor, I have nothing to thank you. I guess it's my turn. Uh, me? No, I don't have a microphone. Okay. Uh, okay. There's supposed to be an empty seat here. I guess we lost the seat. But there is an empty trustee seat here, and I would like to get that filled by our next board meeting, May 24th. <clears throat> so I'll be accepting the recommendations from the trustees. Uh, sooner than later, that'd be great. Uh, and then just uh, and trustee Ivan just informed me that he posted it also on the village website for the village trustees. I received some correspondence in case you guys were interested from uh, Commissioner Deborah Sims. They're having a breakfast with. Cook County President Tony Crankwickle, uh, Tuesday, May 16th, over in Pozen at uh, her office. May, I'm sorry, um, May 16th, from 8 to 10.30. And also on Thursday, May, or supposed to be Wednesday, May 24, which starts at 4 So, never mind. <laughs> Items. Um, I did want to thank the members of our BFW who participated tonight in presenting the flags for the meeting. Um, members of uh, the Club Lothian who are here tonight. Um, we also have two former village clerks here tonight, uh, Clerk Bob McCadam and uh, Clerk Mopatempo. Thank you all so much.